We're really pleased to welcome him here today, and uh, Matt will talk with us on the fundamentals or the art and science of cheese making. In this talk, I really want to go over the fundamentals of cheese making, kind of uh, the building blocks of cheese making. Uh, this isn't, isn't going to go very uh, deep, but it'll be a broad perspective on cheese making and the process of cheese making. Um, Do we get any cheese? Uh, there will be cheese after the talk. Yes. <laughs> but not during the talk. <laughs> Wasn't really a good way to do that. But, um, yeah, so I mean, obviously, the fundamental uh, first ingredient of cheese making is milk. Uh, the flavor, texture, rind development, everything that makes cheese great or transcendent, or you know, if it's not good milk, terrible, uh, starts with the milk that goes into it. Uh, for this reason, cheesemakers will always tell you that without good milk, you're just simply not going to get good cheese. You know, uh, an old Vermont cheesemaker once told me that uh, your main job as a cheesemaker is if you have good milk, just not to f it up. So, <laughs> But, you know, good milk really starts with the cows and the health of the cows and the quality of the feed that they're eating, the way they're treated. Um, you know, the cows at Churchtown spend the warm months on pasture, eating the fresh grasses, herbs, and flowers in the fields that surround us here. Uh, in the cold months, they move into the round barn where they're fed uh, the hay that our farmers make while the sun shines. Uh, you can physically see the difference in cheese made from summer milk as compared to winter milk because it's actually a much more golden color and that's from the beta carotene that is present in the fresh grass uh, which doesn't it breaks down in the hay once it's dried but you'll find that in the fresh grass um, you know a self-sustaining cycle is a basic principle of biodynamic farming so you know we really the feed for the cows should be grown in the same soil uh, on which the cows walk you know so that our cows, you know, are eating the grass from the fields that immediately surround us. And that's, you know, the farmers work hard to make sure that, the, you know, the, the forage here is high quality and, you know, that the cows get what they need from it. Uh, and that then gives us, you know, high quality milk, which is then reflected in the cheese that we make. Uh, the composition of milk. So basically there are four essential uh, components of milk. Uh, there's fat, protein, uh, primarily casein, so uh, the protein in milk is 80% casein and 20% whey protein, approximately. Um, the lactose, which is the sugar in milk, and that's really the primary ingredient on which uh, the microbes that make cheese, cheese, uh, live on. So, you know, lactose is sort of, you know, the food for the microbes that make the cheese. Um, the fat that is butter fat, which is what gives the cheese its richest in flavor. Uh, the triglycerides contain 98% of the overall milk fat. And they, as they break down, that's the breakdown of the fat is uh, one of the essential, the fatty acid compounds is what helps to develop the full flavor potential of the cheese. Uh, calcium as well is an essential ingredient. There are other minerals as well, but primarily calcium. Um, Calcium ions strengthen the protein molecules in the milk, and calcium provides a more solid structure to the curds and to the cheese as it ages. Uh, Giannakos Caldwell, who wrote a book called Mastering Artisan Cheesemaking, says that you can, a good way to think about calcium in cheese is as uh, the mortar. If the protein are the bricks, then the calcium is the mortar. So it really, you know, if you don't have enough calcium, it won't hold the bricks together. And as uh, lactic acid forms in the milk, it tries to break down the proteins. And the, uh, the calcium, the mortar for the bricks, really holds it together. So calcium is a very fundamental ingredient in cheese making. Uh, here you can see the differences between the milks of uh, cow, goat, and sheep. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers there. It might be a little small. But you can see that uh, cow and goat are sort of roughly in the same uh, uh, area in terms of amounts for uh, fat and protein, uh, about 3.7, 3.6, and these are rough averages. You know, different uh, breeds will have very, you know, will have varying numbers. But you know, sheep, sheep really stands out, especially when it comes to fat. Both fat and protein are much higher. You know, almost double for fat. Uh, so yeah. that's one of the reasons why sheep's milk is highly prized for um, cheese making because it does have so much fat and protein in it. The downside is that sheep produce much less milk uh, per animal. So 
it's you know it is more of a challenge to uh, to make cheese with sheep because they make less milk per animal and they also make it for a much shorter season. So a lot of uh, sheep's milk cheese makers will actually buy milk in either cow or goat's milk in the off seasons to make cheese year round. What's up with the ash? The ash. Oh yeah. So this is a, this is a chart from. Um, uh, American farmstead cheese, and they use they refer to ash as that's another term for mineral. So ash refers to the general mineral content, not just calcium, but the other minerals as well. So uh, here we look at uh, some of the characteristics for brown Swiss milk, which is uh, our herd is primarily brown Swiss. We do have a couple of Jerseys, a couple of Guernseys, um, but. Uh, in terms of brown Swiss milk, you can see that it's about 4.2% fat, 3.49% protein, uh, as compared to Holstein, which is kind of you know the ubiquitous breed of America, which comes in at more like 3.9% fat and 3.2% protein. Uh, and then Jersey, which is one of the standouts in terms of uh, fat content, uh, which is as high as 5% uh, for Jersey which is why uh, Jersey is, pre is uh, prized for butter making, for one thing. Uh, a lot of uh, traditional Swiss cheese makers in Switzerland, I mean, will, uh, they have Jerseys and they will actually skim the milk off, skim the fat off from the milk before they make the cheese. So they'll make butter with the fat and then uh, cheese with this, the partially skimmed milk. Uh, but brown Swiss, you know, as in terms of their milk, it is a good sort of uh, middle point. You know, it's kind of a, it's a great uh, milk in terms of the components for the kind of cheeses we make here: uh, the Wendell and the Peggy and the Copperthwaite, and fresh cheese as well. Uh, so in this talk, we're going to be looking at basically the basic steps of cheese making. Uh, you know, it's got a long list, but uh, we'll be walking through all of these. Uh, you know, one way to think of it is that milk is basically water with solids suspended in it. It's uh, fat globules, proteins, minerals, vitamins, enzymes. To make milk into cheese, the first step is to separate a good portion of those solid components from the water in a controlled way. So that's when you're curdling the milk, that's essentially what you're doing. You're separating out those solids. Um, cheese making is essentially controlled spoilage. I mean, that's what you're doing, you know, I mean, the most fundamental thing you can do is just take, you know, a bottle of raw milk and leave it out at room temperature overnight and it will curl on its own because uh, a lot of the cultures which we use in cheese making are actually uh, basically isolates of cultures that naturally occur in milk, so in raw milk and are present in it. So, you know, what cheese making is essentially taking that natural process that would occur that the microbial population would trigger but doing it in a much more controlled manner. Uh, lactic acid bacteria is a, you know, the primary uh, ingredient in that process, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, the primary process in uh, creating cheese is changing the structure of uh, specific types of milk proteins, and those are the casein proteins. Uh, the best way to think about casein proteins is, is uh, little balls with uh, hairs floating, uh, hanging off of them. So a casein is basically a little ball with these little micelles hanging off it, and they're basically in the milk that are kind of floating around and bouncing against each other in suspension in the, in the uh, milk. And uh, you'll see, we'll talk about it later, but when you make the cheese, the enzyme that you add to the cheese actually cuts the ends off those little micelles, and then they start to bond and that's what forms the uh, curd. But the first step in cheese making is to warm the milk. So once the milk is brought over from the milk room, we put it into the vat, and at that point we heat the milk uh, to the temperature that is optimal for the cultures that are being added to it. So in the case of Peggy, we're heating it to 94 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in the case of Wendell, it's 88 degrees. Uh, so depending on different cheeses, you'll have different temperatures that you want to heat it to. Uh, and this is not including, uh, for Peggy, we uh, unfortunately have to pasteurize it. So we actually heat it first to 145 degrees and then cool it back down to 94 degrees. So with a raw milk cheese, you don't need to do that pasteurization process. 
And these temperatures are optimal for the development of the mesophilic cultures that we add, because there's uh, two types of cultures, starter cultures that we work with in cheese. There's mesophilic and thermophilic. And mesophilic are basically uh, cultures, lactic acid bacteria that are uh, that operate at lower temperatures and are sensitive, more sensitive to heat. So if you heat it above 105 degrees, those mesophilic cultures will start to die off. Whereas a thermophilic culture is a heat tolerant culture. So in the case of traditional Swiss cheeses like Comte or Gruyere or Emmentaler, you're actually working with thermophilic cultures, which are um, heat tolerant. So you're heating the milk much higher. Uh, the cultures are then added to the milk after it's been warmed. And uh, for the Peggy cheese, as an example, we use uh, these are just a few of the cultures we use. We add the MM101 starter culture, which is the lactic acid bacteria that will actually start to acidify the milk. Uh, this is, uh, and then the, uh, another one we would add is the LBC81 adjunct ripening culture, which is basically a culture that we add uh, for the uh, develop aroma and texture development in the cheese. And these, the influence of some cultures, like the starter culture, starts to act almost immediately. As soon as you add it to the milk, it's going to start ripening the cheese. Whereas something like the LBC81, you won't see the effect in the cheese until much later. <laughs> and then uh, another example of a culture that we add is the Penicillium candidum, which is a rind culture. And that is actually the culture that it's related to penicillin, hence the name. And it's uh, the rind culture that actually creates the white rind on traditional uh, French cheeses like Camembert and Brie. So anytime you see that you know classic white rind on cheese, you know that that's the penicillin candidum in it. So uh, after the cultures have been added, the milk is allowed to ripen. So it depends on the cheese, but you know there's a sort of uh, a certain number of hours that you're allowed to that you allow it to ripen. Uh, in the case of the Peggy, it's uh, three hours at 94 degrees Fahrenheit, and the Wendell is about an hour and a half at 88 degrees Fahrenheit, with the milk being stirred as it's ripening to encourage you know to get the cultures well blended in and um, you know, encourage the ripening to occur evenly in the milk. Uh, at that point, once it's ripened, that's the point at which we add the rennet, which is the coagulant that we use in the milk. Uh, and rennet is derived from the stomach lining of young ruminants, uh, specifically the abomasum, uh, which is where milk is digested when the animal is young. So uh, this is it's essentially an enzyme from the stomach lining. And uh, traditional cheese, uh, cheese makers in Italy and France would often use strips of, they would basically take the abomasum, dry it, and then actually cut it up into strips that would almost look like fruit leather. And then you could take one of these little strips and stir it into the milk. And that's how you would rent it. In. So you know, now it's a, an isolated form of the enzyme that comes in a liquid. So and that's what we add. But uh, one thing we do, we would like to do here at Churchtown at some point is actually Get, one, get an abomasum and dry it and make our own rendit here. You know. So, um, the chymosin enzyme in the rennet is what actually causes the uh, coagulation to occur. <coughs> but as I was talking about before, when I was saying that the, uh, you know, the, the micelles on the casein actually get cut off, so you can see that that's essentially what's happening here. You have the, the casein with the micelle, with the negatively charged. <coughs> and because it's negatively charged, they won't connect to each other. So they're basically suspended in the milk here, you know, and just floating around freely. And, you know, you have the, the proteins, and then you have the fats floating around with each other. And then as soon as you add the chymosin enzyme in the form of rennet, it starts cutting those ends off. And at that point, they start bounding and basically creating a, a matrix in the milk. So. That's what you have here. So you actually have you know, basically a three-dimensional matrix of protein forming in the milk. And as it forms, you have these fat globules that get trapped within there. So then eventually, over about an hour or so, or depending on how long it's going to take, uh, how much rennet you add, it eventually forms into a solid gel. So And it's just a solid gel protein matrix with fat globules suspended within it. 
So at that point, once you've uh, once it's uh, set for you know an hour, hour and a half, or however long you, you need to set it, you then check for a clean break. And you can see here this is an image of checking for a clean break. So what you're doing here basically, in this case, the, the cheese maker is using a knife and basically putting a, a cut in the cheese in the curd and then lifting it up gently and you observe how evenly and how like smoothly it breaks apart. So if it's you know not firm enough yet and you do this, it'll tend to be kind of yogurty in texture and liquid. Whereas once you have a clean break, it'll kind of break very cleanly and evenly and you'll have these nice smooth surfaces. So at that point, you know that it's uh, ready to be cut. And at that point, if you know that the curds are ready to cut, you then uh, cut them with uh, cheese harps, which are basically these large, you can see here, these, are, so that's a uh, cheese harp here. So basically, you're, it's like a large harp that has a, one of them has vertical wires and the other one has horizontal wires. So first you cut it vertically and then you cut it horizontally and what you end up with are the curd cubes. So if you've ever um, seen, you know, like fried curds or something like that, where you have these little balls of curds, that's basically the first step is cutting it, you know. And at that point, it goes from being this solid gel filling the vat to being all of these individual curds. So. Uh, with the peggy at this point, you would begin, you would allow the curds to rest for a little bit and then you would start to stir them. And with the peggy especially, you want to be very uh, gentle when you're first starting to stir it because the curds are extremely delicate at this early stage and if you stir them too aggressively, you'll tend to kind of break them up and release, you can break the surface of the curds and you'll release, the fat will get released from within. And you don't want too much kind of loose, non-encased milk fat in your cheese because if it's not enclosed within the curds, then later on in the aging process, it'll tend to cause uh, off flavors and rancidity and things like that. So you really want to be very gentle and allow the curds to kind of seal up on their own. And basically what happens is that as you're stirring the curds, they're very slowly, they form a skin essentially and solidify and then they're also releasing uh, whey and moisture. And so they're becoming firmer and drier and um, and kind of stronger. Uh, with a cheese like Wendell, you would actually cut the curds up more thoroughly into smaller pieces, and then you're heating the milk from 88 degrees to 100 while you're stirring it. So you're stirring it more aggressively than you would with the Peggy, and you're heating it for a half an hour and getting the temperature up to 100 degrees. And by doing that, the application of the heat results in the release of more whey and the formation of smaller curds, which means that you'll end up with uh, drier, firmer curds at the end. Um, so here we have uh, assistant cheesemaker Joe stirring the curds. This is the vat, so you actually have a, an agitator paddle there, and then we use a shovel as well just to kind of keep the milk moving evenly within the vat. So once the uh, cheese has been stirred and the curds are, it seemed like they're uh, sufficiently uh, firmed up and taken, uh, you know, a good form. At this point, we would uh, mold the cheeses. So this is the point at which the curds are taken from the vat and put into molds, which is where they will kind of take on their final shape. And you can see here, so you basically have these molds, which are kind of have a popcorn-like texture, and you're filling these molds. In this case, this is the Peggy cheese. So you can see in his left hand there, Joe has one of the Peggy molds. So those are basically the curds were ladled from the vat into these individual molds. So for you know an average Peggy batch, we might have about 100, of, or 100 to 160 of these molds that are getting filled individually. So a lot of cheesemakers will actually use block molds, which are basically big sort of blocks of molds that are all connected. So you can fill them all at once and then flip them as one big unit. So it's like 20 at a time are being flipped. But in the case of the Peggy, we prefer to use the individual molds. Uh, we like uh, what we get in terms of uh, the texture and the moisture retention and everything with these molds. So, and yeah, you can see that once they've uh, been molded, then we're actually starting to flip them. So this is what Joe is doing here. And this is also the point 
at which we start to monitor uh, pH. And pH is uh, the acidification of the cheese. So basically, uh, as when you add those lactic acid bacteria starters, what one of the things you're doing is beginning the acidification process. So the milk is uh, becoming more acid in those uh, subsequent hours after the starter culture has been added. And once you're um, flipping the cheeses, you're really keeping a close eye on the pH because uh, the higher pH uh, is, so basically you, the, the lower the pH is, the more acidic the cheese is. So higher acidity is lower pH. So you're watching the pH as it drops. And for each cheese, you have different target pHs that you're going for. So uh, for example, you know, with the Peggy, it's 505 is our target pH for the next day, whereas for Wendell, it's 4.8. For fresh cheese, it's 4.4. And those may not seem like big differences, but actually, because pH is an exponential curve, it's, uh, you know, th there's a pretty significant difference between 505 and 4.4. That's, the fresh cheese is much more acid than the Peggy would be. And for, you know, for each cheese, we have our uh, target pHs that we're going for. Um, and it's uh, vital to sort of to hit your target pHs because the lower the pH is, the drier the cheese will be. So uh, with the cheese like Peggy, for instance, if the pH were to overshoot and go too low, you would end up with a more acid curd and you would end up, the next day, you would find your cheese was drier than you would ideally like it to be. So for example, if you've ever had a brie style cheese or something like that where the interior was really chalky and dry, that may be a matter of the pH having dropped too low. So basically the pH dropped low, it became acidic, uh, released more moisture, and the final cheese uh, ended up drier than you would have liked. And so then as it ages, it'll end up being drier and chalkier and never quite developing that like the gooey texture that we're really going for. Yeah, here we see this again. And this is actually uh, the pH monitor, that we, the pH meter that we use. So we're basically every time we flip the cheese, we're checking the pH again. So this is 6.43. Uh, just for reference, milk starts at around 6.667 generally. So this is kind of early in the drop. Um, Matt, once it's, once you, can you change the pH or is it totally set once you're out? It's pretty, uh, change it in what sense? You mean like? It's, it's fine, it's not where you want it to be or would you make a different cheese? Oh, no, no, you would, you would make the same cheese. You would just, you, you can't, so no, the answer is no, you can't change the pH like mid, midstream. Yeah, once it's. Yeah, you can, what you can do though is that, and this is, when you drain it overnight, basically once it hits the target pH, so for, uh, Peggy, for instance, we're going for uh, about uh, five, uh, five, six pH is the moment at which we start to cool the cheese. So at that point, before that, the room in the the temperature in the room is about ninety four degrees, and to, to kind of keep the cheese at that temperature. And as soon as uh, it hits the target pH of like five six, we cool the room down rapidly. And basically, cooling will also slow the pH drop down rapidly. So. One way you can't really you can't reverse it, but you can uh, if you see it's kind of dropping very quickly, you can kind of you know put the brakes on basically. Yep. How would people do that before air conditioning and climate control? Um, I mean, to a certain extent, but no. I mean, yeah, in traditional cheese making, you really had to work with you know the conditions that you had, you know. But. Um, yeah, I mean, traditional, you know, like obviously uh, 100 years ago or 500 years ago, cheesemakers didn't have pH meters, so they didn't know the actual number. They couldn't work with that, but they did. They could, they nonetheless understood intuitively that acidification was happening in the cheese and could recognize it, you know, so it was more of a hands on approach to cheesemaking. But yeah, so as you can see, the Peggy is cooled to 63 degrees Fahrenheit as soon as the cheese hits the target pH. And as soon as you do that, as soon as you cool it down, the pH drop will just kind of like level out very rapidly. And the moisture loss will slow down a lot. Um, so, you know, there have been 
uh, one time recently where I, I, the temperature didn't drop, there was a malfunction with the air conditioning, and you could really see the next day the temperature stayed at that high temperature, and the cheese ended up you know, much harder, much drier. So we ate that here. We that ate that here. That was the statue. <laughs> <laughs> it tasted good, but it just never, never got gooey. You know, it just it had lost way too much moisture because it had just been too hot and too acid overnight. So, uh, so the next day uh, is when we actually salt the cheese. And this is a pretty uh, critical step. I mean, salt is one of the most important ingredients in cheese. Uh, the Salting has both immediate and long-term effects. Probably, you know, the, fast, the immediate effect is that it significantly uh, stops, slows the uh, pH drop. And then it will also, uh, in the case of the Peggy, we dry salt the cheese, which means we apply uh, granular salt to the outside by hand. You can also brine cheeses, which basically means you create a salt brine and submerge the cheese in the brine for uh, a certain number of hours, depending on the size of the cheese. So a Peggy, a side of cheese, uh, cheese like the Peggy might only be a few hours, whereas a Wendell, if it were brined, would probably be, you know, could easily be like 10 hours or longer. So uh, one of the other things that happens when you salt it is that basically with the dry salting, the salt actually gets absorbed into the cheese through osmosis. So you have moisture. As the salt gets absorbed, you have moisture being released. And basically the, the moisture, the way that's being released is trading places with the salt. So the salt is working its way into the uh, center of the cheese. It goes all the way into the center? It does, yeah. It'll go all the way through. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh. yep. Yeah. And I mean, I think sort of the full absorption of the salt probably takes like a, you know, a couple of days. Of, you know, it's a kind of, especially with the cheese like the Wendell, you know, it's a much slower process. You know, with the Peggy, it's pretty quick in terms of how quick. I mean, it sits overnight and drains after it's been salted. So. But, uh, yeah, so salting is essential to, you know, get the final moisture content because, you know, if you add too much salt, you will lose more moisture as well. And salting really influences the microbial and enzymatic activity in the cheese. Uh, because certain microbes will are dependent on different uh, salt levels for their, you know, to sort of to create that ideal environment for them to live in. Um, so, for example, like a blue cheese molds prefer a higher salt environment. Um, and it's really, salt is essential to flavor development in cheese as well. You know, it's not, without salt, if the salt is too low, it, like too little salt can really be uh, worse than too much salt because with too little salt you often develop uh, bitter and off flavors in the cheese. So, and too much salt obviously is not a great thing either. But. Uh, so this is the point, at that point after it's been salted and drained for another 24 hours, the cheese gets moved down to the aging space. Uh, so we have here, uh, past the round barn, there's actually a door that leads down into a cave, and that's where our aging space is. Um, so we uh, transport the cheese from the cheese room here over to the cave, and it goes down there. Uh, diff, depending on the, the cheese, the aging, the amount of aging times vary uh, quite a bit. So with Wendell, which is a raw milk cheese, semi-hard cheese, we have a minimum of 60 days that we have to age it because uh, due to FDA regulation regarding raw milk cheeses. Uh, but ideally, we like to age it, you know, three to four months at least before we sell it. And it can be longer than that. It can go six months, eight months, even a year. Uh, with the Peggy, though, it'll only live in the cave for about uh, 14 days or so before it gets wrapped and moved to a refrigerator. Um, and there's there's a cave in on Bergen Street in Brooklyn. Yes, you, you yeah, crown with finish it. caves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so mm -hmm. great. Um, but I never understood exactly. I mean, they have they have what they refer to as green cheese. Green cheese, yeah. So, so this is the moment when they're taking yes, it and they're putting exactly. it in their cave. Yep. So okay. That cheese basically the day after salting is green cheese. You know, so that's like cheese that is. It's brand new cheese, basically. Yeah, so, and they get it from all over. Yep. I mean, from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you probably, you probably they do know them very well. well. Yeah. They, they work with Old Chatham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also various uh, Vermont cheese makers. Yeah, um, 
Pleasant Valley, and yes. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, so green, so basically green. they, you know, the cheesemakers make the cheese and then ship it within a day or two of making it down to ground finished caves. And they're the ones who actually take on the aging process. So, and that's similar to um, a place where I used to work, Jasper Hill Farm, they do that as well. So they would, they make their own cheese there, but then they also have uh, this complex of caves, the, the vaults they call them. And they age cheeses for other cheesemakers there from across Vermont. So, yeah, different cheeses really need different ideal conditions. For the Wendell, you want it slightly drier in the cave, so ideally around 88% humidity, whereas for the Peggy, it's more like 92%. So, in, you know, because we're working in a single space, like, you know, a place like Jasper Hill, for instance, they have separate vaults for all the different styles of cheese, and each one is kind of dialed in for whatever cheese they're aging with. Whereas in our case, we have a single space, so we kind of have to work within that space and find the different areas of the cave that are ideal for the different cheeses. So for the Wendell, we find that being kind of near the front of the cave, where the door is always opening, so it tends to be drier because you're getting more airflow there, is the best place for the Wendell. Whereas for the Peggy, we tend to keep it more towards the back of the cave because you know, you'll get less airflow back there and less drying, so it tends to be uh, moisture back there uh, and a higher humidity. Uh, and the temperature in the cave is about, uh, on average, it's like 48 to 54 degrees. Uh, we like, like 50 to 52 is kind of where we like it ideally. Um, and the cheeses get flipped on a daily basis. Uh, the Peggy gets flipped on a daily basis. And during its early aging, it gets sprayed as well. So we have actually a brine culture. Uh, so it's a, a salt brine with cultures added to it. So we basically spray the wheels with that a few times early in the aging process and while we're flipping the cheeses. And then we do that until we start to see the first signs of the rind actually starting to grow on the cheese. Uh, with the Wendell, which is a natural rind cheese, we are pretty much allow them to go wild. And uh, so we do add rind cultures to the Wendell. We have a, but we also, with the Wendell, we really want to encourage the growth of the wild cultures that are present, that are endemic in the cave down there. So, you know, you'll get the cultures that we add, such as Mycador, which is a traditional culture used in French cheese making, uh, which gives it kind of that grayish rind and also um, I guess you could say cave flavor, cave aroma, for lack of a better term. But then we also see uh, you know, a variety of wild cultures that grow on the rind of the Wendell as well. And the Wendell gets flipped daily at first and then uh, until it's kind of stabilized. Because at first it's still pretty wet, so the moisture you know, moves quite a bit. So we try to flip it daily and then eventually, once it's stabilized and dried out a little bit, then you flip it weekly as it's aging. So here you can see the Wendell on the left. So this is uh, from October 12th. Um, so it's a little hard to tell, but you can, you're can you getting starting to get the first growth of rind cultures on there. So if you see, like in there, you get a little bit of the, the white and the gray growing there. So you'll also get a little bit of a reddish. Uh, we have a Brevibacterium linens cultures that grow on this rind, uh, which will give it a bit of an orangey red glow. Uh, and then on the right, we have some of the Peggies in the cave, and you can see an older batch on top, which has fully developed that white rind. <coughs> and then the batch on the bottom is a newer batch, which has not developed the rind at all yet. So we basically, you know, within like uh, a week, you'll start to see sort of a first frosting of that penicillium candidum on the outside of the peggy. And that's when you know that the rind is really developing. So. Um, so, yeah, as I said before, once we move the cheese down to the cave, we see the development of both uh, expected and unexpected rind growths. So on the Wendell in particular, we see the growth of the mycador, which is that fuzzy gray mold. But we also see the appearance of um, <coughs> blue molds similar to uh, Penicillium roccaforti, which is uh, the, the mold that's used in blue cheese, the traditional blue cheese mold, uh, which grows. And the interesting thing about that is that we have never actually made blue cheese in this cave, 
But what we found as soon as we started aging cheese down there is that we actually saw the appearance of blue mold on the cheeses. And it is pretty much you know, identical to blue cheese mold. And, you know, it smells like it, it tastes like it. Um, but we never, we never added it. And it's on the Wendell, it's okay to have that cheese growing on there. You know, on, on these cheeses, you'll tend to get uh, the growth of blue mold. You'll get like little spots of blue mold over time as it's aging. And they tend to, we brush them off, but it does definitely having that blue mold there influences the flavor in some of ways. So, um, and I mean, the legend about blue cheese is that a French farmer left a wheel of cheese and a loaf of rye bread in a cave one day and <laughs> came back a couple weeks later and found this blue mold growing all over his bread and all over his cheese and tried the cheese because that's what you do when you find moldy cheese <laughs> and you know, blue cheese was born. So, and actually traditional uh, French uh, Roquefort makers, the AOC uh, Roquefort makers, especially uh, Papillon Roquefort, still use the rye bread to create their blue cheese uh, cultures. So they'll actually, they bake these loaves of rye bread. Basically they bake them until they're burnt. I mean, they put them in the, the caves, the cheese caves, allow them to develop a full you know, coverage of blue mold, and then they basically scrape it off and use that in their cheese making. So that's another way. I mean, if you ever have you know, a loaf of bread that sits on the counter and starts to get blue mold growing on it, that is essentially blue cheese mold. So you, you could try, you could try adding it to if you want. <laughs> um, you know, we also see uh, a lot of other, we uh, see molds such as a scopulariopsis, which is a velvety brown mold that uh, grows on the cheese, especially in higher humidity conditions. And that will uh, tend to, we try to avoid having that grow there because it will actually, as it's, grow, as it's growing on the rind, it'll actually kind of eat into it and create little pits in the rind. So that's, one of, that's another one of those molds that you often find in environments like that, which we try to avoid. Are there um, any colors of molds that you would definitely avoid with your cheese and how we're in? Um, I mean, you know, I would say black mold, but you know, there are actually like uh, non-harmful black molds. I mean, generally speaking, most of the molds that you're going to find on cheese, especially cheese like Wendell, is not going to are not going to harm you. You know, so I mean, the the things that will harm you in cheese are not are not things that you can see visibly. You know, if there's uh, some kind of pathogen or something like that. So, but in terms of mold growth, I would say you're you're pretty much safe. You know. Um, on the Peggy, the mold that we have the most trouble with is called Mucor, which is also known as Poil de Chat, which means cat hair in French. And this is a gray black mold which will show up on, which will sometimes show up on the Peggy and the Copperthwaite. Um, and it'll basically start as little, uh, you know, dark spots, little gray and black spots, and then over time you'll actually start to get little sort of sprouts of mold hair, which, you know, gives it the name cat hair. But um, so this, I mean, the interesting thing about that is that it's not actually harmful. It has minimal effect on the flavor, but it's just, it's mostly an aesthetic thing. Like people just don't want, you know, gray molds, black molds growing on your uh, peggies. You know? so, and you'll see that same mold will grow on the Wendell, but in that case, it doesn't really affect it because once you brush the, brush the wheels of Wendell off, you know, you pretty much, the, the mucor goes away. So. Um, or it doesn't go away, but it's just, it gets brushed off. And there are actually French cheeses like Tome de Savoie, where they um, encourage the growth of mucor. So it's actually one of the, you know, it's kind of an essential ingredient in it. So if you ever see a Tome de Savoie, it'll be this very kind of gray, fuzzy wheel. You know, that's, that's what they're going for. You know? So a lot of times with cultures, it's all about, you know, which cheese it's on. In some cheeses, it's considered a defect and in others a feature. So with blue mold, for example, uh, with Cabot, or I'm sorry, cloth-bound cheddars, British cloth-bound cheddars, you'll, um, you'll often see little, uh, like within the cracks in the cheese, you'll see blue mold growing there. And in that case, it's not considered a defect, you know, it's really considered a feature and a, contribu a contributor to the flavor profile. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you get that same blue mold growing in sort of a, you know, traditional industrial you know, cheddar, American cheddar, that then would be considered a defective cheese and probably wouldn't even, you know, be sold, or that part would have to be cut off, so. 
Um, so in terms of the benefits of aging, so uh, I should say first of all that affinage is a term for aging of cheese. It's a French term that basically means uh, cheese aging and care. Um, in terms of the benefits, you know, first and foremost, you know, as the cheese is, is sort of living in the cave at those ideal temperatures and humidity conditions, you know, you see that uh, uh, within the cheese, it's drying out, it's becoming denser, it's, uh, you have uh, lipolysis and proteolysis acting on the cheese, which are basically lipolysis is the breakdown of fats and pro proteolysis is the breakdown of protein. And those are uh, essential processes in sort of creating the final flavor profile. So that's really a lot of the flavor in, in a cheese like Peggy, you'll see, you know, when it starts, when, uh, you know, a one week old Peggy will be fairly firm and dry and kind of and chalky. Whereas a two week old, three week old, as it ages, it'll start to break down more. And uh, so that lipolysis and proteolysis are what give you that final gooey texture in the cheese. You know, because that's really literally the cheese breaking down and becoming gooier and softer. And, you know, if you've ever uh, had a cheese where when you cut it open, it just basically like spilled out of the rind, you know, just kind of like poured out of the rind. That's kind of the end point of lipolysis and proteolysis. It's kind of the total breakdown of the internal structure. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it often tastes great at that point, but some people are a little turned off by it. I love that. <laughs> you know, and actually, you know, one of the fun things to talk about is uh, tyrosine, which is a uh, the magic flavor crystals of cheese. So in, uh, if you've ever had like an aged Gouda or an Alpine style cheese or a Parmesan, you'll see little spots, little crystalline white spots on the cheese. And that is tyrosine, uh, sometimes referred to as flavor crystals. You know, they're actually, it's actually tyrosine in the case of Alpine cheeses and calcium lactate crystals in Goudas, Cheddars, and Parmesanas. And essentially, these are minerals that are precipitated out uh, from the moisture and form these little crystalline pockets. And so when you eat the cheese, you'll kind of experience that as little pops of flavor. Um, but uh, as well as that, you know, you, with the, the aging of the cheese uh, contributes to the texture development. So, you know, as it, you know, a, uh, a young Wendell, for example, if you taste it at like, you know, two or three weeks, it'll tend to be fairly gummy and not, that just doesn't, the mouth feels not that great. But then as it ages out, once you get to like two months or three months, then you really start to get the, the texture that you're going for, like that ideal texture. Uh, and likewise with flavor, you know, if you taste a young Peggy, for example, Early on, it'll tend to be kind of yogurty and a little, uh, a little acid and not that interesting, just kind of a bland flavor. But then, as it ages, that's when you in the cave. That's when you really get that the flavor development. You start to get, you know, all the kind of the mushroom, the, the grassy notes, the chicken broth, all those like flavor profile that you're going for in the Peggy. Um, and then rind development as, as well is, of course, uh, important. Um, because that's where, really where you're going to get the rind growing is while it's in the cave. Uh, so, I mean, one of the questions we often get are, you know, why raw milk versus pasteurized? And I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, raw milk has uh, all the eight essential amino acids and is rich in uh, minerals and enzymes, which are necessary for the absorption and utilization of sugars and fats present in the milk. Um, it also has many beneficial enzymes and bacteria which help in digestion. And for raw milk cheese, the, uh, all of the, the microbes and enzymes that you find in raw milk really contribute to that final flavor profile. You know, You're saying which, those are destroyed in pasteurization. Which are destroyed in pasteurization, yeah. So essentially when you pasteurize the cheese, where you're, you're basically creating a blank slate, you know. You're, you're wiping out the microbial you're population. Blank slate, you're wiping out yeah. the population. So, so you're not killing those enzymes when you eat it for the second time up to 100 degrees? No, yeah, so it's really, you know, pasteurization is 145 degrees for 30 minutes, so, and that's, that's what it takes to kill those, and at lower temperatures you're not going to, I mean, you may, 
you know, with uh, an alpine cheese in particular, where it's heated to like 120 or so, 130, you might see, you'll see some loss of that, uh, some drop in the population, but it won't be, you know, erased completely, so. But you're saying the enzymes are also destroyed, though. Uh, all of those things are... Some of the, yeah, I mean, they are, yes. Yeah, so they're partially destroyed okay. by pasteurization. And the microbes, de and microbial the microbes population is definitely, definitely yeah, wiped out completely. Right. So, um, and that's why, you know, many people who find, who consider themselves allergic to milk, whether through lactose or protein intolerance, will find that they can eat raw milk cheese. And it may be because of the presence of those enzymes and bacteria which really help in digestion. So, and yeah, as I was saying, it really contributes to that flavor profile that you're going to get in the cheese. You know, it's with a pasteurized cheese, you're essentially the only influence on the flavor profile is going to be from the cultures that you add. Whereas with a raw milk cheese, you're getting the influence from the other, uh, the native cultures as well. And you know that does you know one of the charms and challenges of raw milk cheese making is that you don't always know what you have in the cheese, so you you know the results are not always 100 percent predictable. So you'll get especially you know seasonally as well, you'll see changes in the cheese uh, based on the microbial populations. But that's also one of the charms. You, know, you just have to understand that like you know when you're work when you're eating raw milk cheese, you may not always get the exact same cheese, but it'll always be interesting. Yes. <laughs> you know, and one of the things, you know, that we often talk about is why raw milk is considered dangerous. And in the majority of cases, uh, pathogens and contaminants in both raw and pasteurized milk are introduced not from the milk, but from post-processing contamination. So essentially, you know, it's more a matter of, you know, human error. It's either, you know, uh, improper sanitation or hygiene or, you know, I, you know a, a dirty workspace, either in the creamery or later on in packaging or, you know, it can go all the way to the cheese counter. You know, you just never know. But it is primarily, you know, the risk is mostly from, you know, improper handling, improper sanitation and hygiene and less from the milk at its source, especially if you have, you know, responsible farmers you know, who are working cleanly and carefully. You know, that's, generally speaking, that's not where you're going to get the contamination from. You know, and you also see a lot of, uh, you know, you see uh, outbreaks in other foods as well, but we generally speak about it very differently when it's raw milk versus when it's, you know, cantaloupe or turkey or, you know, ice cream, you know. You don't, you know, when there was the uh, Baby Bell ice cream or the Blue Bell, sorry, Blue Bell uh, Listeria outbreak, they didn't speak of it as a Listeria outbreak in pasteurized milk ice cream. You know, the fact that it was pasteurized <laughs> was not even discussed, you know. Whereas if any time it's a raw milk uh, outbreak, it's always discussed in terms of it being raw milk first and foremost, you know, they kind of discuss it in those terms. So, you know, nobody ever says, you know, you should stop eating cantaloupe because there was once an outbreak, you know, Listeria and cantaloupe. So. I, I assume the milk coming out of the cow is sterile. Uh, it's not sterile. Oh, it's not? Um, no. Um, I mean, well, a lot of the, act, actually, it's a good question because, yes, I mean, it is mostly sterile within the cow, but then right. as soon as it's coming out, basically it's getting inoculated immediately as it's coming out. So, you know, you have... Um, microbes on the, in the teats, uh, the canal, and the skin of the udder and the teats. Um, you know, you're getting it from the, the, uh, the bedding, from the air, from, you know, so you're getting the microbes from all, basically from the farm environment. Are you saying the, the, mi the microbes do not start in the milk itself? Not within the cow, no. Not within the cow? Yeah. I mean, there's a primary, uh, much of it comes from outside of the cow, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or as it's as it's leaving. Much, yeah. but not all. Not much, but not all. Yeah. So, so Matt, having the cheese cave um, adjoining the round barn where mm -hmm. the cows spend the winter, I, it's too early for you to see, you know, year by year. But do you notice any difference in the cheese 
when the cows are in the round barn and maybe some of the more microbes come through the air into the cheese? Um, we maybe a little bit. We definitely notice more activity in the cave actually in the summer. So not as much related to the round bar, but related more to sort of the weather. And like this summer, which was very hot and very humid, we saw a lot more mucor and we saw a lot more other microbial activity down in the cave because of that. Because you just, you know, the environment outside of the cave is much more active and that it definitely like permeates and penetrates into the cave. Is um, that why they, they don't want you to, they don't bring anyone into the cave in, for instance, in Earth. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. Still, it's, 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 so, it disrupts yeah. things, or you you could bring in. Something. You can definitely, yeah, you can definitely bring in, okay. you know, various microbes yeah, from the outside. So if you visit them, you know, they'll have you take your shoes off or put booties, uh, little tiny <coughs> booties, over your shoes. You have to put hair nets on, right. and jackets, and everything, yeah. so just to go into their cave, you know, or in our cave as well. Sure. So, yeah. Um, the microbes you're talking about right now, are they the more pathological microbes and not, aren't there, are the other microbes inherent in milk? Uh, yes. The, uh, the good microbes that... Yeah, uh, no, we're not talking about, the, I'm not talking about pathological microbes here, or pathogens. Not. No, oh, okay. no. Right. This, this, I mean, there are, you know, the microbes that get into, I mean, some of them, like, you know, from animal feces, of course, you may have some... Um, uh, right. pathogens coming right. in, but primarily, you know, the microbial activity of the farm definitely introduces itself into the milk okay. in positive ways. Oh. And, you know, this kind of brings us to the question of terroir. So, you know, in the age of, when we're working primarily with cultures from, uh, that are laboratory produced, you know, does terroir still exist in cheese making? Um, you know, is a cheese made in California different from a cheese made in the Hudson Valley if they're both using the exact same cultures from the same companies? Can you say what the word means precisely? Oh, terroir. So basically, a terroir is, um, you know, the, there's a, the, someone else came up with the term a taste of place, which is a good way of putting it, sort of like, you know, the flavor, like with wine, it originates with wine, you know, it's the idea that like wine produced in a particular place yeah. and environment will have particular a particular flavor profile that is unique to it based on that environment, you know, so that, you know, wine produced in Bordeaux will be very different from wine produced in Alsace, you know, it's, and even within those little, within those areas, you know, you'll get terroir from one farm to the next as well. So we so. should be able to get Terroir, yeah, so here. definitely. So, yeah, and, se and seasonal differences. What's that? And, and seasonal, seasonal and definitely yeah. seasonal differences as well. Yep. So, yeah, winter milk versus summer milk. You know, you'll see big differences, and just you know, in terms of, as I was saying, like sort of microbial activity is very different in the middle of summer than it is in the middle of winter. Um, but so yeah, the question is, do you, how much does uh, where you're making the cheese influence the cheese and I mean it's not it's a complex question there's no easy answers but you know there's always going to be local variations um, you know different farms have the, there was a study done in France where they really looked at different farms within a small area and found that each farm really had a very distinctive microbial population even though they were not that far from each other only a few, you know a few miles down the road but you'd have a very different microbial population on that farm from the next. So, and that definitely influences the cheese as well. So. But that's their goal, whereas with industrialized mm -hmm. milk and industrialized cheese, they want it to be one standard. It yeah. tastes yeah. the same definitely. no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terroir is what you, we want right. cheese, we want, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's the yeah. distinction. Yep. Yeah, I mean, with industrial cheese, obviously, you're going for consistency. You right. The product always be identical, whereas uh, here we're really looking for, you know, how do we produce a cheese that expresses, you know, the identity of this farm and this environment. So that's why you took craft out of the name, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. But, um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the areas that we would like to explore here at Churchtown in the future is... Uh, actually uh, experimenting with uh, wild cultures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, actually developing, you know, working with uh, 
milk and allowing the development of sort of the native cultures of this place rather than, and what are, you know, it's natural in the milk rather than adding the cultures. Um, there's a farm called Parachel Creamery, and they actually uh, started a project called the Cornerstone Project where they took four cheesemakers and they took the same recipe by using wild cultures and they made the same exact cheese and the same exact, you know, mold, same exact format. Uh, and the only difference was that each one was using their own wild cultures. And basically, with the same recipe and the same cheese from these four different farms, you know, you'd see pretty big differences in, uh, you know, the final flavor profile and what the cheese ended up as. So you can really see the influence in a project like that of, you know, the local um, microbes. So, yep, it's the end. If there's any <laughs> questions. Are there any rinds that you should not eat? Any rinds that you should not eat? Uh, yeah, I mean, ba basically any artificial rind. So sometimes you'll see goudas that are covered in wax and plastic. But yeah, and basically any all rinds are edible. Oh, okay. Ah. They're, I mean, all natural rinds are edible, but, you know, they're not necessarily, it's pretty, I would say it's pretty subjective. It's up to your personal taste whether you want to eat the rind or not. But you can, as long as it's not wax or something. It's part of the process, it's part of the cheese, right? Can you talk a little bit about how you originated the cultures, kind of the recipe for each of the cheeses? Um, so, I mean, basically, I, I worked, you know, having worked, uh, made cheese at other cheese making facilities like Jasper Hill, you know, I had some, you know, experience working with certain styles of cheese, like the Peggy, for example, uh, the, which is a, considered a bloomy rind cheese. So bloomy refers to that, the white mold that grows on the outside. So basically kind of starting with what I uh, learned there, I then uh, developed, and from previous experiments in R&D on my own, working with bloomy rinds, I kind of developed these recipes, you know, in which I, and kind of tweaked them as I was going you know, kind of as you're making the cheese, you kind of see what you end up with and you start to adjust the cultures, you know. Where do you get the original culture? Is there a starter culture? <coughs> uh, well, the original cultures are, are, most, are for the most part purchased, so it's mm -hmm. uh, coming from culture companies. So it's actually, it comes in a, like, freeze-dried powder mm -hmm. is the culture. Matt, so. mm -hmm. they mentioned that you were making cheese in your Brooklyn apartment. Well, yeah. What did you do before that? <laughs> what I do? Oh, uh, yeah, so uh, about a decade ago, I was uh, actually a white lover. So. <laughs> yeah, so. Happier now, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> ten, ten years ago, I got kind of deeply interested in cheese and started, uh, started I wrote a blog called Cheese Notes and started writing for various uh, food publications and uh, like Culture Magazine and Edible and uh, Modern Farmer and stuff like that. And then ended up doing a program at the University of Vermont for cheesemaker certification and then went to work at um, Woodcock Farm, and then later at Jasper Hill Farm. Yeah. Any other questions? I am making a Parmesan cheese. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you plan for Rick? I know, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but yes, uh, we do actually have a, that's one of the dreams of uh, Rick Anderson, who's the architect who built all of these amazing structures that you see here. Uh, it's the development of a Parme uh, Hudson Valley Parmigiana. So. <laughs> 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 it's two years to age, right? Yep, two years. So come back in two years. <laughs> 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 if I remember correctly, one of your early slides, you were saying that the Peggy, the milk for the Peggy gets heated mm -hmm. up to 145 and then is held yep. at. Mm -hmm. How long is it 145, and what are you actually doing with uh, okay, the so, and stuff there? Yep, with the Peggy, with Peggy and Copperthwaite, we have to pasteurize it because it's aged less than 60 days. So when we basically uh, pasteurization is 145 degrees for 30 minutes. So, so you are doing a full pasteurization. Yeah, full pasteurization. That, how do you and, think that has impacted the flavor if all of the stuff that you're talking mm -hmm. about? Uh, that works so well for the Wendell right. has now been taken out of the uh, picking the copper weight. Yeah, I mean, it definitely uh, impacts the flavor. I mean, it, you know, we need to kind of to work with the cultures more with the cheese like Peggy because 
you know, and it is basically a pasteurized milk is a blank slate. You know, it doesn't have any natural cultures in it. So uh, we re you really have to kind of like work with uh, the cultures to bring back. Uh, essentially, you're trying to bring back that raw milk flavor in pasteurized cheese. So, and that's sort of you know dependent on which cultures you're using, what you're adding, and you know how you're aging it. But you did that with the copper suede a bit. Can you explain that? What happened? With what? With the copper suede. You, didn't you let the copper suede oh. mature in the cave? Yes, a while? mature longer. Yeah, longer. so we let the copper, the copper suede actually stays in the cave for much longer than the peggy. The peggy is about 10 to 14 days. Copper suede will tend to stay down there for three weeks or longer. So, and by doing that, you're really allowing uh, allowing it to age more and allowing it a little bit more of that wild culture in some instances as well. It's a different flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're also, with the copper thread, we do use different cultures as well because that orange rind on the outside is, uh, comes from the Brevet bacterium lemons that we wash it with. I see. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, did you have a question? Is there a way to promote tyrosines and cheese? To promote tyrosines? Um, it's all magic. It's all, yeah, I mean, basically, it's the longer it ages, the more likely you're going to get tyrosine. So you're more likely to see it in cheeses, you know, that are one year, two year, three, you know, three year aged. You know, you're less, you're not going to get them in younger cheeses very much. You know, so it's really a matter of sort of like the moisture release and you know, how long it you disagree or no. No. <laughs> but there are actually companies like you know some of the um, uh, larger like industrial cheese companies are actually trying to work on ways to accelerate the development of tires so they're ba they're basically trying to like sort of you know find a shortcut you know so you add a certain culture to it and get the tire seams developing much quicker but you know, see if it actually works like terroir, are you saying mm -hmm. that the, the yeah, bacteria needs to have a particular place? Mm -hmm. um, could it not also be, oh, I don't know, artisan cheese makers, we have bacteria based mm -hmm. on our hands and mm -hmm. our bodies and everything yeah. like this. So when you have like artisan makers who mm -hmm. are maybe more you know, interactive with their product that are not in such a sterile environment, right. but do you find that the cheeses that they're able to make, the obviously mm -hmm. the flavor profile will be different for theirs. Right. But mm -hmm. can you recreate that and maybe um, I mean, definitely, you know, I, I mean, unfortunately, in America, because of the regulations, it's a little tougher to be hands-on with the cheese, and you really have to wash your hands well and everything, um, which is a good thing, mind you, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, but you definitely, you know, with the bee linens, for example, the Brevet bacterium linens cultures that you get on the washed rind cheese, which is that orange rind. <coughs> you know, it's orange, it's a little bit sticky, it's more of the stinky cheeses, you know, it's more aromatic. And Brevet bacterium linens are actually a culture which we find, uh, it's a bacteria that we find on the human body as well. And it's responsible for, it's essentially responsible for body odor. So, you know, if your cheese ever smells like gym socks, it's actually, no, it may actually be because it has bee linens. But so that's kind of an example of a, you know, that's probably a bacteria that, you know, back in the day would have been introduced to the cheese from, potentially from the cheesemaker's bodies when they're even working with the cheese directly. So, it's, one more question to Jeff. Yeah, is there any cultures and microbes involved in like making fresh mozzarella and how what is the big difference? Because that's so immediate. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it all about just the cooking of it? Um, I mean, yeah, the texture. So it's a pasta. It's a it's like a stretched curd pasta wow. filata cheese. So the the texture of mozzarella really comes from that heating. So you basically you make. Day one, you make the culture, you make the curds. So basically, you start with like a block of curds. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you are using like starter culture and whatnot. Uh, but then, really, the texture of the mozzarella, mozzarella comes from day two when you're cooking the curds and heating them up quite a bit, you know. And you know, then you're you're, oh, sorry, <laughs> and you're stretching them, and that's when you, the stretching is what really gives it that mozzarella texture. And they could be made with raw milk as well. Yep. Oh, yes. um, so are you going to ever do that? <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah
Plans for mozzarella. Uh, <laughs> possibly, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we get enough requests, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, or people can make mozzarella yeah, at home. It's a very easy cheese to make. Yeah. I mean, we have thought in the past about maybe doing like a mozzarella making Flash. cheese making class mm -hmm. in, okay. in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, I neglected to mention at the beginning Matt is a uh, very modest uh, first year entering you won both first and second place in the um, New York State Fair artisanal farmstead no, farmstead soft ripened farmstead soft ripened <laughs> category um, and the moment that at least Lee has been waiting for since the beginning, we do have a cheese tasting set up for you, so you can um, taste both the Copperthwaite that won first place, the Peggy that won second place, and I do think if you had entered the Wendell, there would have been another prize but <laughs> next year. So um, please stay and join us. The cheese tasting will be back here, and you have some books set up, it looks like. Oh, uh, yeah. Madeline. Yeah, there's a selection of books here. If, you're, if anyone's looking for uh, reading materials and wants to learn more about uh, cheese making, there's a bunch of books over here that I, I would definitely recommend.